and they might have people in all of those locations that want to join the same conference, you don't want them all going to a single server at a single location and all being conference there. You have local conferences on all of them that then are mixed together. And actually, I see some people raising their hands because they've probably done this. So, yeah. So, right. Right. And so what you end up with is a very distributed network and local conferencing for the people that are local to an office, which means you have low bandwidth requirements across your wide area network. It's especially important when you have things like, you know, one of the offices in LA, another one's in Tokyo, and another one's in Sydney. Now you have much more costly bandwidth between the offices. So and this is another area where we've seen a lot of interest in using asterisk. Um, People are connecting to carrier networks that want voice codecs that they don't have on their phones, for example, or can't support on their phones, or they're interconnecting multiple carrier networks together. So because Asterisk is, um, well, we like to say it's protocol agnostic, we speak every voice over IP protocol that there is, basically, that has any traction in the industry at all. Um, and, and then, of course, we also speak TDM protocols, PRI and SS7 is coming in the next version and things like that. We also support basically every voice codec that we can. Now, that list, I think that list is actually complete for what we support um, in Asterisk today. It's missing a lot of codecs, though. The reason it's missing a lot of codecs, though, is because all the cool ones that people are using now have about a, st a stack of patents about this high behind them. And they're very, very difficult to implement, first of all, in an open source way without violating the patents. But even if you manage to, to get a non-patent infringing implementation of them, then all the users have to pay licenses to use them. And that's a very difficult thing to do for a piece of software that you just downloaded from the internet for free. So we're working on solutions for those. but. Those will generally revolve around um, cellular networks, cellular network codecs, because that's obviously a big area where people are connecting to cellular networks. Um, and also now there's a big push to do wideband audio. I don't know how many of you have experienced the pleasure of listening to a wideband audio call, and especially a wideband audio conference, but it's really quite amazing. So someday we'll actually be free from the restrictions of the public telephone network, and you won't be limited to 4 kilohertz audio anymore. So. This is an area where people use asterisk. I guess you could call it sort of as a session border controller, although I hesitate to use that terminology because it doesn't do all the things that an SPC does. But it can certainly be used as an edge device to connect multiple networks together, uh, change voice formats between them, and even do protocol conversion. So we have people out there who may be providing, uh, maybe like a tier three voice over IP carrier, and they're buying minutes from lots of different carriers around the world, and they may find a really awesome carrier in some country that only does H323, and the rest of their network is SIP. Okay, well, they'll put a, a group of asterisk servers sitting in between their network and that carrier and say, okay, we're going to do protocol conversion between the two. So. This is actually something that's relatively easy to set up in a clustered environment because you have total control over everything going in and out. It's not like you have wild stuff just happening in this area. But All right. And then, of course, there's the big stuff that people want to do, which is to actually use Asterisk as a voice switching platform, and in some cases as a video switching platform because we support video media streams as well. Um, so there's basically three big areas that you, most people are using clustering to accomplish. And this is really the most common one. Um, and that is that they've reached the point where one server can't do the job anymore. They just don't have enough performance to do the job. As I mentioned before, there's no built-in load balancing functionality inside Asterisk. And we don't really see any reason to build any because there's excellent external products to do that. Um, in the case of SIP, that's OpenSUR. In the case of, say, TDM connectivity, maybe you have a large group of PRIs from your telephone company or you have SS7 trunking. That's going to be done on the switch that services you. They're going to figure out which trunks to send calls to based on which ones they're busy. But the point here is because of the way Asterisk is architected, it's extremely simple to say, well, I don't want to just have one of these. I want to have six, and I want to have them all act exactly the same way. The dial plan is extremely easy to share between servers. And for those of you who haven't used Asterisk, there weren't very many hands. So I don't know how many people that is. Every, pretty much everybody else has. Um, unlike, say, traditional uh, voice switching platforms where you used some arcane interface to build these massive translation tables of incoming numbers to outgoing numbers and things that you could do to that, 
the call routing in asterisk is very much like, uh, I'd say it's almost like a programming language, but it's a very simple one. It's very scripting oriented, which means that once you've developed a dial plan that does what you need, it's very easy to replicate it to other servers and have everything act the same way. And then we have multiple methods of actually monitoring the servers to make sure that you can actually balance the traffic between them. And if you want to take a server offline, do so and have the load balancer stop sending calls there. One of those, again, is that management interface that I mentioned before. And then we also have support for SNMP for those of you who have large networks of routers and switches and other things that you manage with SNMP and want to watch statistics of. Um, you can do so using an asterisk now as well. Make sure I'm not running out of time here. This, of course, is the second big reason why people want to cluster asterisk servers, and that is that they're concerned about failures of some kind, whether that's a software failure or a hardware failure, or even just the ability to take the system offline to be able to do an upgrade or a change in configuration. They want to be able to have all their traffic still survive. Again, the first step there is to set up some sort of load balancer so that the calls are being distributed among the cluster of asterisk servers. But the second part is the important one, and that is you've got to figure out a way to share all the information between the servers so that they all know what's happening at all times. For example, a lot of people, a lot of smaller uh, ITSPs are using asterisk to provide service to small businesses and they may have sold that small business a trunking package that only allows them five simultaneous calls for example even though we know there's not five physical trunks associated with that they've sold it to them that way well if they have a cluster of 20 asterisk servers providing that service then there has to be a way for all of those servers to communicate with each other to know that there are one, there's one call active on this server and two on that one and one on this one and if they try to place two more they won't be able to do that. So we have methods for doing that already. I mentioned some of them before being able to store information in databases and then I'm also going to show you on another slide uh, protocols that we have that are built in asterisk already for helping to do these sorts of things. But one of the interesting points here, unlike um, most, I'll say, commercial products, again, packaged products, is that there's no special knowledge, no special protocols you have to support, or special links you have to set up between the servers or any of that to make this stuff work. It all uses the things that you're already familiar with if you're familiar with using asterisk in the first place.